Welcome to our Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy graduation and our final wheelhouse talk of the academic year. My name is Abby Sachs, and I have had the pleasure of serving as the program assistant for the Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy throughout this past year. Throughout a year of evolving policies, changing expectations, and last minute changes to virtual programming, one thing has stayed consistent throughout all of that. Time and time again, these students have shown up to workshops and events with a desire to learn with and from each other. I often tell people who ask me about my role that I just facilitate what happens at the CLA. The real learning comes with the students uh, from each other and with the community. Ralph Hounstein created the Center for Presidential Studies with the goal of building ethical and effective leaders for the 21st century. I stand before a group of students who I know have taken that mission to heart and that embody Ralph's vision of a society filled with ethical, effective leaders. In just a moment, I will introduce one of our outstanding students, Kiasha Cargill, to introduce Wayman Britt for our final installment of the Wheelhouse Talk speaker series. After Wayman's remarks, we will offer time for audience Q&A, so hang on to those questions as you think of them. For those joining us on Zoom, please utilize the Q&A toolbar function to submit the questions that you may have. Kiasha is a third year student studying political science and public administration. She aspires to work in government, and this summer she will be traveling to Washington, D.C. for a congressional in internship in the office of Senator Gary Peters. Please help me in welcoming Kiasha to the stage. Hello, my name is Kiasha Cargill, and I am so excited to have the opportunity to welcome a remarkable public servant today. Women was appointed county administrator as administrator and controller for Kent County in 2017. During his time with Kent County and upon his retirement in July 2021, he received numerous recognitions, awards, and acknowledgments about his service to Kent County. Prior to his role with Kent County, he held several management positions at Steel Case and Michigan National Bank Central. Women re-engineered Kent County's performance measurement programs establishing the Performance Excellence System and Excellence in Action Program, a first for county governments in Michigan. It was recognized by the Michigan Association of Counties and the Michigan Local Government Benchmarking Consortium as a practice. Women is a recipient of the University of Michigan's Fielding H. Yost Award for Academic and Athletic Excellence and helped to lead his team to the Big Ten Championship in 1974 and the National Championship against Indiana in 1976. The university's Wayman Britt Outstanding Defensive Player of the Year Award is given out annually in his honor. He is a member of the Greater Flint Area Sports Hall of Fame and the Flint Area Afro-American Hall of Fame. He is passionate about getting results, serving others, and currently serves on the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation Board, the Michigan Fitness Foundation Board, and Trinity Health Michigan Board. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. What a great introduction. She's going to be a leader one day for sure. And uh, Abigail uh, has been so gracious with me uh, since she called and asked that I come and do a talk. And I, and I guess the talks are generally about personal stories and what people have uh, experienced in life and how they might uh, help you uh, with your careers and, and your life uh, uh, goals. So I'm, I'm hopefully uh, going to do that today and give you an opportunity to uh, learn a few things about uh, the life of a county administrator and, uh, and about a guy that used to work out in the plants at Steelcase uh, as an employee relations guy, a performance consultant, and uh, just how you get things done. It, uh, it's been quite a quite a travel. Um, I grew up in North Carolina. I lived in Flint for a while. I went to the University of Michigan. You heard some of that. And by the time I came to Grand Rapids, it, it wasn't anything like it is today. Kent County has grown tremendously over the last few, uh, 10 years, in fact, more than uh, you would expect. So I, I'm, I'm so grateful that I was able to be here uh, to witness this phenomenal growth and, and just how, uh, what a wonderful place it is. Uh, I spent time this past week in Delaware with my family uh, in Virginia as well, in Fairfax County and, and Rockville, uh, Maryland, and got a chance to compare notes and see 
what the difference was. And I can tell you that we're in the best place. It's an unbelievable place to live and, and grow a family. So, um, yeah, I want to make sure that I, I share with you um, some thoughts uh, about how things went. And I've got the logo of Steelcase there, so you know who Steelcase is. They're an office furniture manufacturer, one of the world's largest, probably the largest in, in the world. And uh, uh, I was there for 24 years and uh, quite an experience. We, we did a lot and uh, we grew a lot and the bottom fell out and I'll talk about that. And then I came to, Steel, uh, to Kent County back in 2004 as the assistant administrator and uh, had no experience in public administration whatsoever. Uh, I didn't think they were gonna call me back for the job. <laughs> And as it turned out, I was the guy, I was the right guy at the time. I guess my team uh, experience and performance management uh, background was what they needed at the time. So that's how it goes. Sometimes you never know uh, unless you ask. You've got to ask. You've got to be willing to go for your dreams. The University of Michigan gives out the award every year, uh, the Wayman Britt Defensive Player of the Year Award. I'm very fortunate to have that honor. And University of Michigan's head coach at the time I was there was Johnny Orr. He reminded me of my father. What a wonderful guy, what a wonderful human being. He looks like my dad, he's not black, but he, he's got the same hairline. He looks just like my dad. And that was the reason I chose Michigan. And, and, uh, and, and what an unbelievable ride it was. I was six foot one and three quarters inches tall. Uh, should not have been playing in the Big 10 at uh, small forward or power forward at the time. Uh, but uh, I had this edge about me and it came from my father and, and it came from my mom and my, my whole, whole family. We worked uh, years ago uh, in North Carolina on a farm and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Terry Frollo, you see the picture of him, he's deceased now. He was an unbelievable talent. He led the Big Ten in score. He was like number two uh, pick our number one pick for the Philadelphia 76ers back in the day. He's passed away. He, he was killed in a car accident, but he was a teammate of mine at Flint Northern High School. And what a wonderful experience. Bill Frieder was my high school coach. He went on to University of Michigan, Arizona State. You may know who Bill Frieder is. Uh, so I've had some amazing experiences. And then in the NBA, I was drafted by both the Redskins and the Los Angeles Lakers. I never played football. I just simply was a good athlete. And unbelievably, I went there to the training camp down in Washington, D.C. Uh, at their training camp, and I could not believe how fast those wide receivers were. I said, that's not the place for me, and they were hitting pretty hard. I, though I was, I, was, I was willing to make contact, but they were just too fast. And uh, the other reason that I chose to go with the Lakers was because of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Lou, Lou Alcindor. You may remember who he is, quite a phenomenal athlete and intellectual. Today he's written several books. Uh, I remember back when we played together, Kareem was always reading, reading books. And I was the rookie. Uh, he called me Sasquatch because of my feet were the size 15s like his were. You, you see my feet, they're pretty big. Uh, I've got long uh, arms too that helped me a lot with the big guys that we played against. And what a wonderful experience it was to play with the Lakers. Uh, Jerry West was the head coach, Bill Sharman was the general manager. And uh, then, I, then I was picked up by the Pistons. Eventually uh, the league folded the ABA and I was uh, the draft pick by the Detroit Pistons and played with Lanier, Bob Lanier and ML Carr and, and Chris Ford and all those great guys that uh, went on and played with the Boston Celtics. They won some championships, I had a chance to play with them. And uh, so that was, that was a short lived experience. Uh, back then, you never knew whether or not uh, you were gonna get kept because at the time they were losing money. And uh, so I made the move and uh, chose to uh, uh, get out of the NBA and come to work for Steelcase, and, uh, and life moved on. 
A lot of this is being picked up in my book that I've written recently. The past year, I've been busy since leaving the county. I've written a book, and it's called Fulfilling the Dream, My Path to Leadership and Finding Purpose Through Serving Others. And it, it gives a lot of this background that I'm talking about right now, about my past and what I went through, how I, how I overcame obstacles, very difficult times I went through, uh, even while at Steelcase, I went through a terrible divorce uh, and, and lost contact with my children. But now we have great uh, relationships with all of them. Um, maybe not two of them, not, not as strong as I'd like to, but, uh, but we are, uh, we're a family now. And, 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 and it's just amazing what happens to you if you never give up, if you never give up. And uh, this is what this book is about. And it's about how we can use our assets for the benefit of other people. And through that, that's what landed me at the County of Kent. I believe that's what happened because I remember distinctly, I went on a trip to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with Episcopal Church. I met a man by the name of John Guest. He was an Episcopalian priest, but he was an evangelist. And he was doing uh, meetings all over the state of Michigan for some reason at the time. He went to Calvin College, went, uh, went into Holland area with the students. And uh, somehow I ran into him while I was in Pittsburgh. And I had this idea to start leadership basketball camp. And I didn't know how to pull it off. I wanted to take my skills that I had gained in, in professional athletics along with my business skills and, and, and share that with young people through basketball. And the camp went on for two years and then we folded the camp because it was just too much to do while doing my gig at, at Steelcase. But it was always in my heart to do. And uh, the book talks about that. And then, and I'll explain a little bit more as I get into the story uh, about why it's important for you to step into your purpose and step into your, your role that I believe God has for all of us. He's planted these seeds, these treasures that we need to tap into. And uh, it all started for me back in the 60s, the late 60s. I'm not that old yet, but yeah, I'm old enough. Back in 65, 66, 67, when I went to short journey, high, short journey school, not high school, and uh, Mrs. Wall, who was my fourth grade teacher, told me that I would be a leader. She's the lady in the green. If you can notice her, she's the taller lady in the middle, in the middle uh, with the green dress on. And she reminds me so much of my mother. It's unbelievable. Um, but she said that I would be a leader one day. I really didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what a leader was. You know, what leaders did. I just went to school and went home and worked on a farm. That's what, that's what we did. And she, and she saw something in me. She saw something in me, just like we see something in you. Uh, we see something that sometimes you don't see in yourself. And thank God Mrs. Wall saw that in me. And uh, from that point on in fourth grade, when this leadership thing started Resounding in my ear, I, it, it, I perked up and I didn't fray away from it. And uh, I went to Boy Scout camp, had an unbelievable experience, came back and I had this idea, I wanted to go to college. Even when no one in my family had ever thought about going to college and I wanted to go to the University of North Carolina because that's where Dean Smith was. That was the Tar Heels and it just so happened, my dad said, you're not leaving. We're not leaving without you. You're coming with us. My coach wanted me to stay coach, coach, because I was pretty good. I was first freshman starting on that basketball team and uh, in Cleveland High School. Uh, but he said, you're coming. And I thought my life was over. I thought, oh, my God, he's taking my whole idea of sports away from me, moving me to Flint, Michigan. I don't know anything about Flint. And it just so happened that we won two back-to-back -back state championships when I defeated my senior year, and then I was picked up by Michigan. Uh, unbelievable experience. 
And I guess I tell you again, you know, that seed that she planted in me, Mrs. Wall. It was an all black school, segregated school. And uh, well, those, those teachers there were unbelievable. Mrs. Cooper, she's the shorter lady with the purple uh, on. She was an amazing, amazing principal. Man, she was tough. Uh, she didn't take any stuff, but uh, she installed in us this idea that we had something to offer, that we could make a difference, and that we had a purpose. I remember in front of the stage, it's just like this, it's like the auditorium every year we do a devotion. And there was this slogan by Shakespeare that said, to thine own self be true. And that stuck with me over the years. And what that meant to me was never let your dreams, your ideas about what you wanted to do in life ever leave you. Be true to your dreams. Be true to your goals. Don't let anyone take that away from you. Your sisters, your brothers, your friends, the naysayers, take away what God has put in you, which is, for me, to become a leader one day. That's me right there, the skinny guy with a lot more hair, with the plaid jacket. Back in 1979, 80, somewhere around there, with a bunch of guys. Kenny Leatherman's the guy with the, with the glasses on, Bullwinkle glasses, the bunny glasses. John Belsison was the guy that's in front of him there, and then Tom Dreyer is the guy that's next to the bus. And we were headed to a, to a uh, meeting, an all-staff meeting called the Quarterly Business Meeting. Unbelievable at the time. And I was one of the folks that they selected to be in the management training program, the first uh, African-American to be accepted into that program at Steelcase at the time. Jim Hackett, you remember who he is, right? Ford Motor Company. He was there at the time with me. And uh, he went on to become the athletic director at uh, Michigan, as well as he was the president uh, at uh, Steelcase. But these are all the people that I used to hang out with at Steelcase. And uh, one morning, at about 6 a.m. in the morning, we were doing a baseline survey. The president of the company, North America Operations, actually, his name was Bob Ballard. He came to the plant that day to kick off this this idea of a baseline survey. He scrolled through my office, and I was the employee relations manager at that time. And he noticed my light was on. He says, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm here to do the baseline survey, I'm preparing for it with my boss, Paul Pearson. He said, hmm, we don't, we don't get to see employee relations managers here that early in the morning at 6 o'clock. He says, hmm. What do you really want to do? And I said, I want to one day be in leadership. I was a rookie, you know, a young guy, you know, in my late 20s, early 30s. I want to be in leadership one day. And he says, hmm, okay, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> a few weeks later, we were, out, we were all called, all the employee relations managers around the company were asked to go to the pyramid, you know, the place out on uh, 68th Street out there in, uh, out there in Kent, Kentwood. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's now owned by Switch. They do all the technology now, but it's a beautiful building. Anyway, we're there. And uh, he came to our table, leaned over, Bob Ballard, and said, uh, I want you to take one of the jobs one of the supervisors' job in the panel plant. And the other employee relations managers looked around and said, hmm, what, what? They laughed, they scoffed. Because that would have been two steps down from where I was currently at in the pay scale. Why would I want to take a job two levels down? And he said, no, I'm serious. I want you to take the job over in the panel plant. So what do you think I did? Took the job. I took the job. I went the second shift as a supervisor. And I could have gone to first shift, but for some reason I said, okay, I'm gonna let Mark Burkoff go to first because I wanted him to have an opportunity to be with his kids. He had little kids. 
And I had no experience <laughs> with machinery whatsoever. The only thing I knew how to do was drive a tractor, you know, and a, and a lawnmower. But that experience working in that factory taught me so much about people and working with the team. And I left E9000 Division, moved over into the panel basic area, became a, the supervisor for specials. And then a few years later, I became superintendent of the context plant and then became a performance consultant and um, went around the country, evaluated plants, gave feedback to the board, to the uh, president and uh, the leaders of the company, because we were going through some, track, uh, some f fracturing. The, the economy was starting to bust. And then in 2001, thereabouts, actually it started in 1998 and 99, the dot-com bubble burst. You know, the dot-com companies, they just, all of a sudden, they were not selling furniture. It's still case. And then 9-11 hit, same time. We were about 18,000 employees at the time, 18,000. And the company whittled that down. Thousands of employees were lost at the time due to uh, the fracturing that was going on in the economy. And uh, I was one of those that had to leave. I was given the option to leave. And, uh, you know, I could have been upset about that. But I wasn't. I was prepared for that. I had an idea that no matter what happened, I had a purpose and I had a plan for my life. And um, that's mainly what I wanted to, to get to you today to talk about that and about the importance. The importance of never losing sight of your dreams and your goals. Because guess what? Change is happening all the time. It's happening all the time, all around you. Look at what's happening in, in, in Europe and in, in, uh, in Russia today, Ukraine. What's happening there? You know, it's, 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 it's just amazing what's going on in our world. Either we're proactive to change or we're reactive to change. True leaders initiate change. True leaders make change happen. We're either going to be victims of change or we're going to be agents of change. And guess what? We were all born to lead. We we're all born to lead. It's in us. Someone's, there's a saying about, you know, you were, you were not born to lead, you were made or something like that. But guess what? I believe that we were all born to lead. No matter your, your race, your, your creed, it doesn't matter. What church you're from, it doesn't matter. We're all born to lead, we have it in us. And the problem with that though, is that it just doesn't happen. It ha you have to believe it and you have to want it. That's why when Bob Ballard came to me, he said, what do you really want to do? I knew what I wanted to do from listening to Mrs. Wall and, and thinking about it over, over the years before becoming a supervisor or an employee relations guy. I wanted to be a leader. You, you, have to, you have to want it. You have to feel good about it. And you gotta know what it will take to get you there. And if you don't know, you gotta ask somebody. You gotta read a book. You gotta go to a class. You gotta study like you're doing here at Grand Valley. You know, but guess what? We need leaders. We need more leaders. We need true leaders. There was a song back in the 60s or 70s, I can't remember. Dinah Ross, remember her? Supremes, do you? You really? Okay, okay. And she, and she sang this song, what the world needs now is love, sweet love is the only thing that there's much too little of. I think that's how it went. But guess what? That's really not what it needs love. We need love. We need love. But what we really need is leaders. Who, those who are willing to stand in the gap. Those who are willing to challenge things. To ask the question. To not be afraid of challenging yourself. 
to be better. And I believe that oftentimes it's not because, it's not because the desire isn't there. It's because of fear. It's because of fear. You know, getting ready to come out here today, there's a little fear, a little trepidation coming about, coming out here to speak. You didn't know who, who this group was going to be and whether you were going to be friendly or not. And, uh, and I'm glad I did it because I see Carol Hennessy out there. She's county commissioner. Hi, Carol. And uh, one, of, one of the wonderful leaders of Kent County. And, and I'm so happy that, you know, she's here because she knows what I'm talking about. And being a leader isn't easy. It isn't. It isn't, folk, let me tell you. You know, even before I came to the county, living in that world, it's still case. I felt sometimes like it was, I was living in a shark-infested water system because even as a supervisor, trying to become a, a, a better leader, stronger leader, there were always roadblocks. There were always questions about my authenticity. And even to the point that they would say to me, some people would say to me, you're too professional. Now what, what kind of, what is it? You have too much energy, you have too much drive, and then you don't have enough drive. I mean, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a whole bag of things. But guess what? I never let that get my dauber down. I didn't listen to that flack. I believed in myself. And that's what you need to do. I know you're destined for greatness. I know that. I believe that. I see it in your eyes. Especially I see it in your eyes. I've heard that you're going to uh, Washington, D.C., hang out with Peters. He's a cool cat. Uh, and, and what an opportunity it is. And that's how it happens. It's the relationships. It's the Kareem abdul It's the Jerry West. It's the... It's the Bill Martins, it's those people that you um, get to know. And again, I can't say this enough. You have treasure in you. That's, that's, that's what I believe so much in my heart. No matter who, who you are, how short you are, what color hair you've got, what background you're from, you have something to offer this world. And we need to make sure that every, every person gets the opportunity to become who they were meant to be. Who they were meant to be. The richest place in, on this earth is the graveyard. The richest place on earth where inventions were not made. Beautiful music, songs, records, not made. Beautiful cities, not made. Opportunities that were lost, that could help this world be a better place. Why? Oftentimes, we sit back and we watch it happen. I remember working at the county and we would go, and I went through our correctional facility. And you see the young men and the young women that are there in our juvenile detention centers. And you say to yourself, wow, you know, they're, they're going no, no, nowhere fast. And then the children that are in the foster care system, same thing. My goodness gracious, what we do to each other to undermine the gifts that we have. And over time, it just keeps happening and happening time and time and time again. It never stops. The only thing that's gonna make it stop is for leaders to rise up, for you to stand in place. I made that decision. It wasn't fun, it wasn't easy, but I made that decision and I made a mark. I made a difference, I know I did. I thank God for it, but we need more. We need more. We need true leaders on the scene. And, and I'm just so happy that I didn't let the setbacks that came along my way to push me back, to cause me to fret. The blame, the shame, okay, the ridicule. 
tell you a story real quick, and I'm going to move on. Before I took the job at the county of Kent, I was called, asked to come in for an interview. The next step was for me to come and do a physical. I mean, and you talk about the background check that they do on you. It's the physical. They go through your credit rating. They do all this stuff. The sheriff's office comes out and does a visit at, visit at your home. They do all of that before you become uh, a person working in the county. Okay. Two weeks before I had to go to do my background check, it's somewhere downtown here. I was moving my daughter, Desiree, into our apartment building, uh, her and her son, Hannibal, and upstairs on the other side of the apartment complex was a, was a, uh, a dog that got loose, came out of the apartment, got into the mud, out there on the ground, it was puddles everywhere. The dog rushed into my car and muddied the heck out of my car. And I had the hell of a time getting the car, dog out my car. Next thing I know, I hear this guy over here who was the owner of the dog. Hey, what are you doing with my dog? I said, what am I doing with your dog? What are your dog doing loose? The dog has muddied up my car. You need to come and clean my car out. You need to fix this. He came downstairs and got into my car, pulled his dog out the car. I said, you gotta clean, the, you gotta clean this out. Come on, help me clean this. He got right there in front of my face. I mean, like three inches in front of my face and started swearing, I mean, some of the worst profanity of I've ever seen. I don't know how people swear, but that was one of the worst situations. What did I do with that? He was threatening me. Oh, Lord. <laughs> what did I do? I said, okay, I'll, I got it. I'll take care of it. No. If I had done anything to cost him or push him or hit him, guess what might have happened? Kitwood police might have come over and said, hey, look, you need to come with us. But you shouldn't have hit him. That would have been on my record. Because I'm a fighter. You know, I play ball. I take care of myself. But I wasn't that, I, I, I remembered the importance of who I was and what I was about and what I needed to do. And I wish that would happen time and time again. There's so many tragedies that are happening in our world today. And too often, it's because we don't, we don't see the value in one another. There's a story, and I'd like to read it to you. Um, and it's about quitting. And this is a story about a young man who was about ready to give up. I saw that happen at Steelcase while I was there when the downsizing took place. The gentleman that was a superintendent at one of the plants, he went home one day, took the, after he was downsized, took the uh, shotgun and, 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 and shot himself. He had beautiful kids that were in college, college age. And... Uh, I think about him from time to time and anyone else that uh, is about ready to quit. But here's the story. Um, before ending everything, uh, this young man decided to go into the woods to have a last talk with God. God, he asked, can you give me a single reason not to quit? God smiled and started narrating a wonderful story about a gardener. The gardener planted seeds of bamboos and ferns in an empty plot of land that was there. He took care of it daily by watering those plants both the bamboo and the ferns. 
Then one day he was delighted to see that the ferns had popped up. The seeds had sprouted. But nothing came from the bamboo plant. One year went by, two years went by, three years went by, four years went by. But guess what, in the fifth year, one day the gardener finally spied a tiny shoot emerging from the soil. Then he was astounded to see that within the next six months, the little shoot grew into a 60-foot bamboo plant. That's how fast they grow. And God said, do you really know what happened those four years, he says to the young man? He went on to explain that the gardener's efforts of the first four years were not a waste of time and effort, despite the outside world and what they might thought of him. Below the soil, away from the gardener's sight, the bamboo seeds needed developing. They needed to develop their roots and to expand below the surface. This created the strength for fast and sustained growth once the bamboo spouts, once the bamboo sprouted. God then said, my child, life is not uniform and there will be ups and downs. Be patient and persistent. Don't compare yourself to short-term quick achievers who grow fast like the fern. Not everyone achieves success quickly. Your struggling or setbacks are temporary and are actually the building blocks to increase your resilience and propel you to greater and sustained success. The man understood and he went around and he told everybody about that story. And I learned the same thing. I learned in my darkest hours my darkest time, that God was preparing me for something bigger. You know, when I went through the downsizing at Steelcase, when I went through my terrible divorce, it reminds me that we should never give up. No matter the setbacks, no matter the guilt, the shame, the blame, none of that stuff should cripple us. I want to show you something. You remember I talked about leadership camp and about how important that was to me, but I had to shut it down and it just broke my heart. Well, look at this. This, this picture of these young, young, young boys and girls, Boy Scouts, young leaders. These kids are becoming Eagle Scouts for the Boy Scouts of America. They're becoming leaders. Abraham Lincoln says, I believe to believe in the unseen is a triumph and a blessing. The belief I had about doing leadership camp came to fruition. We now have a venture point. We have a leadership program for these kids. So the ideas that I had weren't lost, what I believed in. And I'm so happy that I didn't back away from it. I became President Ford's, the, the council's president, and we were able to to raise six, six million dollars to, to re retrofit this facility out in Walker. And it's where these young people now get to go. They get to learn, they get, they get to grow and become leaders. It's happening. They're working with Ottawa Hills High School students, University Preparatory Academy students, Lee High School. They're working with them now. They're coming out there. The YMCA, the Boys and Girls Club, STEM Greenhouse. They're coming to that facility and they're being blessed by it. Another, another success story. I had, no, I had no experience working in county government. I had no experience putting budgets together, a half a billion dollar budget now, I'm told that the county has. But look at me there. I'm presenting in front of Carol Hennessy, in, in, in front of the other commissioners, the budget. The $500 million budget, unbelievable. And, and, and we did a pretty good job. We never had an unbalanced budget. We always met our AAA bond rating, always. So happy about that. Another success story, human services complex. 
133,000 square foot facility, $27 million. They said it couldn't be done. Well, guess what? We did it. Now we have an all, all in one place for people to come for child abuse and neglect, for people that need uh, assistance with social security needs. I mean, it's, it's just a wonderful place over on 121 Franklin, a few blocks away from 131 and Division Street, right in the middle of the city. It is a beautiful facility, so proud of it. The other one I'm proud of is the Sports Commission. Oh my goodness, that was, they said that wouldn't be done. It wouldn't be profitable. Guess what, it's in its 15th year now in operation. They have a beautiful baseball complex out on, out on 10 Mile Road, out in Rockford, Plainfield. Sports complex, the Meyer Sports Complex. And they're talking about expanding it again. I've been reading about it. They want to expand it more. And that's, that's my friend, Peter Secchia. You may know, know him by name. He was the guy that had the idea. He's, had, he's, he's a force to be reckoned with, let me tell you. You know, I brought all of my employer relations skills to the table when I had to work with Peter Secchia, let me tell you. Uh, but uh, we were able to figure out what to do to get the whole community around this idea. We brought the first National Golden Gloves uh, tournament to town. Uh, Floyd Mayweather donated $75,000 to that effort. And uh, the rest is history. Beeline, Coach Beeline and Izzo came to a lot of those functions. And it's just been an unbelievable success. I brought my basketball skills, my experience working with people to the table, working with Peter. Bless his soul. He's gone now. And then this is my lovely wife, Dinah, in the middle with friends at my going away party at my graduation <laughs> from the county, my retirement. And the people next to her and me are Carol and David Van Andel, who have contributed a lot of the, to the efforts that we put together, the Sports Commission, the, uh, the uh, Boy Scouts, Adventure Point, and the like. Uh, very fortunate to have these people working with me and doing the things to help make our community grow and be better. And that's what leaders do. Leaders put people together. Leaders get things done. They, uh, they do things that, that are impossible. And uh, I'm so grateful for them. I'll leave you with this. A couple more slides and I'll be done. Uh, President John F. Kennedy, one of the greatest leaders of all time, in my opinion. I remember when I was in high school down in uh, Cleveland. He had this big deal of idea about everybody he, want, he wanted, he wanted, he was pushing sports and athletics. And everybody, he wanted everybody to be in health. And that was really cool back then. But one of the things that he wanted to do was send the first man to the moon. Unbelievable. The uh, space war. And um, he was a, we was an individual that wouldn't quit. He believed. He was a change agent. He was a true leader. And one of the things that struck me, I read about, was when he decided to move forward to spend the billions and billions of dollars at Rice University to, to create NASA, to locate that down in, down in Florida and so forth. But, but, but it really started at Rice University. And uh, he asked this famous scientist, his name is Dr. Warner Von Braun, what it would take to build a rocket that could carry a man to the moon and bring him back safely again. Guess what Von Braun said? The will to do it. The will to do it. That's, that, nobody had ever done it. Didn't know how they were gonna do it. You just had the will to do it. And I believe that's where it starts with all of us who have goals and dreams and aspirations. You start with the will to do it. And then I will show you one last slide that's really cool. You may, you may know one of the horses there. I think it's the one on the right side uh, with the blue. The horse's name is Secretariat. One of the all-time race horses run the won the triple crown. In fact, won the last race by amazing 31 lengths. No horse has ever done it since that time. The backstory, and there's a movie about 
this horse. You've probably seen it, Secretariat. You like that movie too, huh? And uh, in the story, there's young, this young lady who's, who's married. She's got kids. They're out in Denver, Colorado, living out there. Her husband's an attorney. And uh, she goes home. Her father's ill, and he's about ready to pass away. And he sees the horse uh, for the first time, and he says, uh, Let him run his race, darling. And she remembered that because guess what? They were going to take the farm away. They were going to shut things down. And she figured out, she figured out how to make the funds available to get that horse sanctioned so that it would, it would be in the, in the winning. Uh, it won the triple crown. And I say this to you, Penny had... No idea. She had no background in training horses. But she figured out through her will and determination what it would take to make that happen. We have vast potential. And I talk about that in my book. We have vast potential, people. And if only we would, would begin to believe um, that anything's possible. And I hope that these stories that I've shared today would lift your spirits, would motivate you, would help you to see the purpose that maybe is in your heart, that maybe you haven't settled on, things that you would like to achieve, that you would say to yourself, I want to run my race. I want, I want to be the next president of the United States or the county administrator or the president of this university, whoever that person is that you want to become. And I want you to remember that it's important that you don't let fear sidetrack you. Don't let anyone tell you that you don't have a purpose, that you don't have value, that you don't have treasure, that you need to share with the worst of the world. And I want to thank you for the opportunity for speaking to you this evening. And I think my 30 minutes are about up. Uh, I told you I was going to make it short as, as possible today. And we'll open it up for Q&A. Thank you. Hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to start off with a general question. Sure. Um, you talked about um, a sense of having will, and my question is going to be a sense of balance. When somebody is still trying to get a better understanding of their confidence of stepping up to a plate and becoming a leader, how does one distinguish between stepping up to the plate versus self-preservation and saying, okay, I need a little bit more time to prepare? Does mm -hmm. one just throw themselves into the opportunity or like wait and say, okay, I need to prepare? Like, how do you distinguish that? And how did you distinguish that? A lot of times, and I've gone through exactly what you're speaking of. And, and it's, um, if you're not sure, uh, you wait. You don't rush into something that you're not completely sure of. But it's your duty to press forward, to figure out whether it is or it isn't. Don't put it on the back burner. Oftentimes what happens to people, I think, is that they, they let it slide and they don't weigh into the opportunity. They don't investigate. They don't do their research. They don't call a friend or talk to a spouse. They just keep it to themselves. Don't do that. And then the other thing I, I always do is pray. And for some reason, it, all, it always comes around for me. Early in the morning, prayer time. And, and spend that quiet time to reflect and say my prayer. And it may not happen that day, but it may be two days later. But oftentimes, it comes to me. And it's protected me all my life. 
Uh, I haven't always made the right decisions, and there's times that I didn't wait, I didn't seek God, I didn't pray. Uh, but I, I believe that's, that's what I would do. The mic. Um, the second question, and it felt kind of like you were speaking directly to me uh, for some of the things that you were saying. I'm going to be going into a field where I'm going to be around people that are extremely intelligent, um, and I feel like I'm going to somewhat be out of my, my intelligence. I'm planning on being a leader. I've been told on multiple occasions that I have the ability to do so. But what am I going to do, or what did you do to convince the people that, like, hey, I'm fresh out of college, going into a, a difficult field, that I'm built for being leaders, outside of that will of, hey, I want to prove it to you. What did you do? Uh, I remember when I had to go and do my interview at the county. I had no background in public administration. I spent hours upon hours reading and studying that organization, pulling information, got on the website, called people. I dissected it, and I understood. So by the time I was in that situation where I was in that interview, and even when I got to the job, I was prepared. But it's a preparation thing, you know. If you have it in your heart, you know, I don't think it's there for some odd reason. It's there for a reason, and, you, and you've got to accept it, embrace it. You know, I had to accept it, embrace it. When I was growing up as a kid, I was six foot one, three quarters. I mean, who who I think I'm going to play, you know, one day, and I had to accept the fact that I was that good and that I could play at that level. And, and it's not being brash or bodacious. It's, you know, it, it is who you are. And, and you, you, you rest on that. You don't have to be cocky about it. You just have to embrace it and not worry about what other people think, not worry about what they say. Just be who you, who you want to be. OK? Um, thank you so much for coming to speak to us. Um, so my question is, for those of us who have barriers whether those be um, physical barriers or racial barriers, sexual barriers, physical, um, how do we get through those barriers to get to where we need to be? Mm. Wow, you're speaking to my heart. I had so many barriers, barriers everywhere. It's like barrier. What's what's the next barrier? I don't know. I, you know, I was a short guy. You know, you think I'm tall, right? I'm six one three quarters, so I, I've got a handicap right there. And my brothers, no, seriously. Six, 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 seven, six, eight, six, nine, six, ten. That's who they were. And uh, I had to have moxie. I had to have courage. And I had to believe in myself. Doesn't matter how short you are, what color skin you have. You have a purpose. You wouldn't be asking that question if you didn't have something to offer. You wouldn't, you, just to ask the question. It's in you. So don't let your, your hair, your skin color, your height, your pedigree, if you went to the University of Michigan, it doesn't matter. If Michigan State, it doesn't matter who, where you came from, where, which side of track you're from. Don't ever let that stuff. Steve Harvey's a great example. You know who he is, right? Comedian. Oh, my goodness. This guy's everywhere. He's on every TV program. He's doing a judge show now. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But he can't string together sentences very well. He didn't let that stop him, did he? I mean, he would turn the lights out if he was here on the stage today. He wouldn't have a script like I'm reading. I'm reading things. He wouldn't do that. He would just let it flow. Uh, but that's Steve Harvey. And I think that we need to not let, you know, the paradigm the paradigms, keep us from creating new paradigm, the new paradigm, you know? Think about Elon Musk. I guess he's got some issues, um, you know, HDHD or something. He's got some background. He's got some issues, right? Now he's trying to buy Twitter now, right? Unbelievable. I mean, this guy's doing, sending people to the moon. I mean, uh, SpaceX and... Stuff like that. How, how does this guy do this? You know, you see this. You see this all the time. And, and, and yet we sit back and we say, well, I'm not worthy. I'm not capable. That's, that's what I would say to you. You have it. You have it.
Next question. Hi. Over here. <laughs> How you doing? Um, my question is, who in your life do you regret um, not being able to say thank you to? My mom. Probably not enough. My mom, she passed away before I got a chance to get down to see her. We just got married, and, and uh, she passed away. I was on a trip to Germany, and I never got a chance to see her before she passed. Oh, man, it broke my heart. Because she, she had this unbelievable way of making people feel good about themselves. She, she, she was a lover of people. Um, there was a poster. The only thing I kept from her when she passed, love is like a butterfly. It goes wherever it pleases. And it pleases wherever it goes. Now, for a young black guy growing up in Flint and then in, in, in Jim Crow area in North Carolina, having a mom who was there to make those biscuits in the morning and to give you the words of encouragement like she did, unbelievable. And I didn't realize until she passed how much she really helped me to be me. So that's what I would say. I would thank my mom, my mother, Mamie Britt, for all that she did to embody the spirit that I have, the person who I am, you know, this guy that wants to help people, that loves people, that wants to empower people. That's my mom. That's, that's where I get it from. So I want to thank her for, because it's helped me along the way. Thank you for asking that. Kind of in the self-help culture sphere, um, and this piece of advice that kind of goes out there, which is uh, don't tell people your goals. Um, and the, the rationale behind this is that if you tell people your goals and they say, oh my gosh, that's so great, you know, you're getting that um, positive feedback, you're getting that dopamine hit of telling people your goals yeah. almost like you would right. if you were meeting your goals. Um, I was just wondering kind of what you thought about that, about how much to talk about your goals yeah. as opposed to how much to kind of keep to yourself. I was warned not to tell people about my book, to not tell people about my book, just write the book. Because what will happen is you start writing a book and you start telling people about it. And then you, you start feeling pressure to get it done or, you know, whatnot, or to, to write it this way or that way. So I think there are situations where you do have to keep some of that to yourself. But I did tell my brother, Jay, and I did tell my wife and others, and was, be selective about who you tell that story to. Be careful. And, that, you know, sometimes your spouse is not always supportive either. They want to protect you. you got to be careful about that. I don't tell my wife everything I'm thinking about, what I want to do, because she's, she's looking out for security. And she's not a risk taker like I am. So I am very careful about ideas with my wife sometimes. Don't tell her I said that. <laughs> but so I do that until she's ready, until the timing's right. Then I said, okay, here's what I think we need to do. And then she said, oh, OK, that's a great idea. But be selective. But you got to have that, um, what I would call the mastermind group that you're with, whether that's friends, teammates, classmates, your mother, your father. It could be your grandma. Somebody that you're out there bouncing this stuff off of to make sure that you don't allow yourself to back away from your dreams. Hello everyone, good evening. For those of you who have not had the chance to meet yet, my name's Grace. I serve as assistant director here at the Howenstein Center. And it is my privilege to be here in person with you all. Sorry, audience, speaking to our graduates for a second. Um, it has been, it's been a couple years um, on this campus and I am really proud for the work that all of you have done through this. And I'm really excited to see what happens next for each of you. So tonight, for all of you who might not be super familiar with our program, these students lined up in the, on the side over here have spent all year as candidates in our program. So they have not earned the designation of fellow until tonight. And I will tell you that over and over again, they have proved themselves to be willing to learn, willing to commit, and willing to serve. And so for that, let's celebrate them. Let's just give them a quick round of applause for all of them.
So tonight, fellows, you do earn the permanent title of Howe and Sign Center Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy Fellow. Congratulations. I, I quickly want to note that I will be reading all of our graduates. We have quite a few that are calling in online. So if I read a name and there's a pause in walking, send your love to wherever they might be calling in from tonight. <laughs> um, and I feel like we need to get this show on the road and celebrate this graduating class. So as I read names, graduates, please come walk across the stage, um, grab your stole and diploma from Abby and Brent. Haley Blair. Rachel Carpenter. Michael Edozier. Micah Fernando. Amalia Gregorian. Madison Edwards. Samuel Jacobs. Samantha Johnson. Leah Johnson. Katie Kozak. Sarah Krishef. Finn Lindbergh. Molly Lombard. Christopher Marco. Peyton Meloser. Uwe Usifo. Ashley Pangan. Estefany Paniagua Pardo. Mackenzie Payton. <laughs> Jacob Petrosky. <laughs> Sarah Powell. <laughs> Madison Riley. <laughs> Annalise Robinson. Morgan Rose. <laughs> Shireen Salam. <laughs> Aziz Graham Sanahan, Jr. <laughs> Hannah Shorky. <laughs> Jillian Smith. <laughs> Triandis Snongrass <laughs> and Elijah Weekly <laughs> If I could hear one more roaring round of applause for our graduates I think I can speak for many of us in this room. We are proud of you and we are honored to know you and to learn with you. Thank you for all that you've given us and we're excited to see what happens next. <laughs> Graduates, I'll ask you to step out the doors and head to Regency Room for a quick picture. Um, guests, 
other students, family members, um, all of those that are here to celebrate, I invite you out to the exhibition hall for some refreshments. Um, I am grateful for you for joining us tonight in this learning, and I'm really eager to continue to get to know each of you and the ways you've impacted our graduates' life. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you out in the exhibition hall.